today's topic is cysts of oral and maxillofacial region. Cyst, cysts of oral and maxillofacial region. Cysts are nothing but fluid filled cavities. Cysts, uh, they may be seen uh, in soft tissue. Uh, the etiology of cysts are different. Uh, they are seen in generalized body anywhere in the body or in the oral tissues. We are specifically concerned with cysts of oral and maxillofacial region only. Yeah, so definition uh, is given by Kramer. It's usually accepted that cyst, it is a pathological cavity which is having fluid, semi-fluid or gaseous content and which is not created by accumulation of pus. Accumulation of pus actually gives rise to abscess, right? So uh, it has been clearly stated in definition that cyst is a pathological cavity which is not created by accumulation of pus and it is frequently lined by epithelia but may also there are cases where there are cysts are not lined by epithelial also so cysts may be of two types epithelial cysts or non-epithelial cysts so uh, epithelial cysts are nothing but true cysts true cysts are lined by epithelial lining true cysts may be dentigerous cysts radicular cysts almost there uh, 70 to 80 percent of cysts are true cysts Pseudocysts, pseudocysts are nothing but which are not lined by epithelium. A few of the cysts we encounter which are not lined by epithelium like aneurysmal bone cyst. So it is a cyst where uh, we can't see any epithelial lining. So that is a pseudocyst. Solitary bo bone cyst is also another cyst which is a pseudocyst. So what is the pathogenesis of a cyst? Why do cysts arise? Uh, how, how, how the initiation of cyst takes place? Actually, uh, in, when coming to oral cavity in relation to the development of teeth and jaws, if we take in relation to development of teeth, a uh, lot of epithelial cells uh, are present. If we take the development of enamel organ, yeah, development of enamel from the enamel organ, we see four layers like uh, outer enamel epithelium, stratum intermedium, stellate reticulum and inner enamel epithelium. So, when the enamel has been formed, the stratum intermedium, stellate reticulum, all that disappear. And both the outer and inter inner enamel epithelium fuse. So, that this fusion is called as the reduced enamel epithelium which covers the surface of crown. This reduced enamel epithelium has lot of epithelial cells. So, due to some irritation or some proliferation of the reduced enamel epithelium, this epithelial rests or the cells present in um, reduced enamel epithelium proliferate and they give rise to formation of cyst. There are a lot of uh, uh, reasons for cyst formation, okay. Not only the reduced enamel epithelium, but there are other uh, cells also uh, during tooth development which give rise to cyst formation. So we have seen that cyst is a fluid filled cavity. So it is a cavity means it is, it is having epithelium so it is having a lumen so we'll see what are the parts of a cyst cyst has three parts that is the lumen which is the central uh, fluid filled cavity it, it is filled with fluid or semi fluid or gaseous content like that uh, the contents of the cyst vary depending upon the origin of the cyst then uh, it has epithelium lining it in case of pseudo epithelial cyst epithelial lining will be flattened or missing then uh, the Epithelial lining, below beneath the lining we see the connective tissue of the cyst. The connective tissue uh, is nothing but the wall of the cyst based on the origin of the cyst, based on the nature of the cyst, uh, the connective tissue shows uh, proliferation by uh, inflammatory cells, lymphoblasts, lymphocytes, etc. So based on the nature of the cyst we can see the contents. So yeah, you can in the picture you can see the lumen, the lining, epithelial lining of the cyst and the wall of the cyst. So there have been lot of classifications uh, for cysts of oral region. Cysts of oral region, they are classified in a variety of ways. Based on etiology, they are classified like developmental and inflammatory. Developmental are nothing but cysts arising during the process of development of teeth. Inflammatory are uh, cysts which are arising because of some inflammation of the oral cavity. So cysts of jaws are uh, broadly they are classified as epithelial and non-epithelial cysts that is the true cysts and the pseudo cysts. Pseudo cysts are nothing but the aneurysmal bone cysts and the solitary bone cysts or the hemorrhagic cysts. 
epithelial cysts epithelial cysts are the true cysts they are again of two types based on their etiology that is the developmental cyst and the inflammatory cyst developmental cysts are those which arise during the uh, two development uh, we see this cyst so they are of two types that is the odontogenic cyst and the non odontogenic cyst non odontogenic are nothing but uh, arising in the soft tissue or because of embryonic origin both these cysts are of embryonic origin based on their relation to the bone they are divided as odontogenic and non odontogenic cyst then inflammatory cysts are nothing but uh, the commonest uh, disease affecting tooth is the dental caries right it is a source of infection for the pulp and then uh, we see periapical infection so inflammatory origin cysts are nothing but the periapical cysts the residual cysts the paradental cysts so we are going to study a lot of variety of cysts uh, in our topic so the epithelial cysts are the first and the, among the epithelial cysts base uh, the developmental odontogenic cyst that is the dentigerous cyst eruption cyst primordial cyst odontogenic keratocyst gingival cyst calcifying odontogenic cyst glandular odontogenic cyst we are going to study all of them and the botryoid odontogenic cyst then the non odontogenic cyst are uh, developing along the embryonic lines or uh, embryonic development there are the nasopalatine duct cyst nasolabial cyst me median palatal cyst and the palatal cyst of the newborn then we are seeing the inflammatory cyst that is the radicular apical lateral res residual cyst and the paradental cyst then we are going to see the non epithelial cyst that is the solitary bone cyst and the aneurysmal bone cyst then there are few of the cysts which are associated with uh, maxillary antrum that is the sinus mucosal the retention cyst post operative maxillary cyst all these are nothing but the pseudo cyst and we are going to cyst uh, which are affecting the other soft tissues of the face that is the uh, dermoid cyst lymphoepithelial cyst thyroglossal tract cyst nasopharyngeal cyst heterotopic oral cyst thymic cyst cysts of salivary gland and cysts uh, of parasitic origin that is the hydatic cyst and cysticercosis so any cyst for that matter what uh, what is the pathogenesis of the cyst uh, there should be some reason for initiation of the cyst beginning of the cyst and uh, and uh, how after the initiation how the progression of the cyst how the expansion of the cyst takes place so cyst initiation initiation is basically it's the result of proliferation of epithelial cells epithelial cells which are normal normal cells are present uh, they are at rest we can say uh, due to some mutation or some change or some irritation they are just stimulated and these epithelial cells proliferate and they result in formation of a cavity see cell rest of melasses cell origin uh, for epithelial proliferation the source of cells is nothing but from the cell rest of melasses cell rest of melasses are nothing but the epithelial cells which we are seeing after the uh, formation of hertwig's epithelial root sheet root hertwig's epithelial root sheet along the periodontal ligament so these are the source of uh, epithelial cells then the reduced enamel epithelium as we have seen during the formation of enamel after the stellate reticulum and stratum intermedium disappear the outer and inner enamel epithelium fuse uh, that is nothing but the reduced enamel epithelium it is a source of epithelial cells uh, which begin proliferation and form a cavity then cell rest of cells are nothing but the cell uh, epithelial cells present in the dental lamina which are a source of uh, uh, epithelial cells for initiation of cavity then once the epithelial proliferation takes place uh, once the epithelial proliferation takes place how do the uh, cysts enlarge uh, cyst enlargement is because of uh, increase in the volume of the contents like we know that cyst is a fluid filled cavity so whatever fluid is there uh, it goes on expanding so in that way the cysts enlarge so increase in size of the cavity it is because of the increase in volume of the uh volume of the contents present there so like if the suppose the epithelial lining uh, it is a mucus secreting line mucus secreting epithelial lining it secretes mucus and this leads to deposition of mucus uh, in the cavity and thereby enlargement of the cyst and transudation and exudation process are nothing but the in inflammatory cysts uh movements of uh, tissue fluid in and out of the cavity occurs because of presence of inflammatory uh, cells 
like lymphokines, phagocytes, polymorphic nuclear leukocytes. Uh, the, the, there is increase in uh, volume of the cavity. Then because of raised internal hydrostatic pressure, raised internal hydrostatic pressure, uh, we uh, as we have seen that whatever be the contents of the fluid, they, uh, the osmotic imbalance is disturbed because of the presence of a cavity with a fluid. When compared to the surrounding tissue fluid, the osmotic, there is an osmotic imbalance. So, and the, uh, the fluid, the cavity itself, it is a semi-permeable membrane. So, it permits few of the substances inside the oral cavity. Mostly because of the osmotic imbalance, the surrounding tissue fluid, it's it tries to come into the cavity. It, it enters into the cavity because of the semi-permeability. And after, the, uh, after there is accumulation of surrounding tissue fluid into the cavity, there is increase in volume of the cavity, which leads to expansion. And uh, though there is a inflow of tissue fluid, the, the, there is retention of this fluid into the cavity. That is, it is not allowed to go outside. Once the tissue fluid enters into the cavity, it is not uh, permitted to leave the cavity. It, there is retention of the fluid. This retention also leads to increased hydrostatic pressure. Increase in hydrostatic pressure leads to enlargement of the cyst. Yeah, another thing is, uh, if we see the contents of the cyst, uh, the, there will be epithelial cells are shedding and they are accumulating in the lumen of the cyst. Uh, there are uh, la large variety of low molecular weight proteins like the albumin, globulin, fibrinogen. If we, uh, if the contents are explored, we see the albumin, globulin and fibrinogen. These, all these are like low molecular weight substances. Uh, so this uh, albumin, globulin and fibrinogen, they disturb the osmotic balance of the uh, cavity and the surrounding tissue fluid and thereby leads to cyst progression. So, and once the cyst has expanded, uh, there is another uh, uh, theory which states mural growth theory. Mural growth theory states that irrespective of the contents, the epithelial cells are undergoing continuous proliferation, right? So, this epithelial proliferation uh, there is a lot of shedding of epithelial cells and they accumulate and they lead to cyst enlargement according to this mural growth theory. There is peripheral, there is the uh, one, uh, uh, base, uh, in this mural growth theory also there are like two concepts. One concept states that there is degeneration of uh, epithelium and the other concept states that there is a progressive, uh, progressive proliferation of the lining epithelium which uh, leads to aggressiveness of the cyst. Yeah, whatever be uh, the mechanism of cyst progression, once the cyst has enlarged, uh, it disturbs the balance. I mean, it, the pressure from this uh, internal hydrostatic pressure, it's transferred onto the adjacent bone. So, bone resorption occurs. So, uh, the bone cavity is enlarged, there is a loss of bone structure, osteoclasts are activated because of the presence of uh, few of bone resorbing factors uh, which are released from the fluids like the prostaglandins. The bone resorbing factors are released and they lead to resorption of the adjacent bone. So this is the mechanism of cyst initiation and progression. Now we will study the uh, individual cysts one by one. So based on the location of cysts also you can identify based on few of the cysts are present particularly in relation to few specific teeth only like the gingival cysts seen in the gingiva. And the eruption cyst specifically seen with uh, relation to erupting tooth and the lateral periodontal cyst which are seen in relation to the lateral periodontal surface area of root only and the residual cysts which are seen after the tooth are extracted, uh, the empty space it shows presence of a cyst, periapical cysts are seen uh, in relation to carious tooth only and the dentigerous cysts are specifically seen uh, with relation to unerupted tooth only. So, we will go with the odontogenic cyst. So, first is the dentigerous cyst. Dentigerous cyst, it is also known as follicular cyst previously. Dentigerous cyst, it is a odontogenic cyst that surrounds the crown of an unerupted tooth or impacted or embedded tooth. So, dentigerous as the name implies, it is associated with the dentin, it is associated with the tooth. Okay specifically with impacted tooth. What is the pathogenesis? 
Suppose there is a primary tooth which is showing periapical inflammation. This periapical inflammation of primary tooth, it affects the overlying crown of the permanent tooth and thereby leads to cyst formation in the permanent tooth. Another pathogenesis, another uh, uh, theory for pathogenesis uh, of dentigerous cyst formation is there is accumulation of fluid between the cells of reduced enamel epithelium. So, whenever there is accumulation of fluid uh, between reduced enamel epithelium and crown surface, it leads to formation of cyst. Uh, whenever you are identifying or um, uh, suspecting a radiographic uh, suspecting a dentigerous cyst radiographically, you have to clearly observe the uh, area because normal follicular space is 1 to 2 mm. If the follicular space is above 5 mm only then it is considered as a dentigerous cyst. Follicular space is nothing but the space between the erupting tooth and the uh, reduced enamel epithelium. So, there is accumulation of fluid between the reduced enamel epithelium and crown surface, there is a epithelial proliferation, uh, then this unites with the lining columnar epithelium of the crown and then uh, there is formation of a cavity. Usually dentigerous cysts are seen most commonly with the impacted tooth that is the mandibular third molar uh, is the most commonest impacted tooth, then comes the maxillary canine or the mandibular premolar area. So, Clinically, clinical features, uh, this dentigerous cysts are uh, commonly uh, encountered at the age of second and third decades, it is the age when uh, mandibular third molars erupt into the oral cavity. So, and when you suspect few of the missing teeth uh, like ma maxillary canine or the mandibular premolar, if it is missing, then you take radiographs, then you accidentally discover that uh, the tooth has been lying in bone with a dentigerous cyst. So, uh, dentigerous cyst is basically uh, discovered on routine radiographic examination. Ma male predilection, so males are predominantly affected, uh, males predominantly show this dentigerous cyst. So, it is invariably associated with the crown of an impacted tooth. The crown is uh, completely lying in the bone or uh, it is like partially erupted, uh, very, I mean, uh, just a part or cusp tip may be seen like that. Expansion of bone with facial asymmetry, uh, because of the presence of uh, cyst cavity, there is extreme, uh, there is root resorption of adjacent teeth, if adjacent teeth are involved, there is uh, expansion, bone expansion takes place. So, severe facial asymmetry, swelling may be seen and uh, displacement of adjacent teeth is seen as the cyst enlarges, as the cyst progresses. So, clinically it is a painless, symptomless, discovered on routine radiographic examination only. Clinically, you can see that few of the teeth are missing or unerupted teeth. So, that time you can uh, suspect this. Radiographically only, it is the only way to diagnose the dentigerous cyst. Yeah, radiographical diagnosis. So, well, radiographically dentigerous cyst presents as a unilocular, well-defined radiolucency with smooth corticated borders. Uh, Little amount of peripheral bony reaction may be seen, sclerosis that is called, uh, little amount of uh, sclerosis may be seen. Uh, so, mostly it is a unilocular radiolucent lesion. Uh, based on radiographic examination, the dentigerous cyst has been classified into central, lateral and circumferential type. Central type of cyst is nothing but the cyst uh, covers the crown symmetrically, that is it covers the crown of the tooth on both sides. Uh, it is attached to the crown. Lateral type is the, it shows the proliferation of sac only on one side as we can see in the picture there. Uh, the epithelial sac uh, is proliferated only on one side like the lateral side. The other side uh, there is no proliferation of sac. Circumferential type is the type which covers the cyst uniformly. So, the whole of the crown is, uh, whole of the crown and the roots are uh, uh, like embedded in the cystic cavity, it appears like that. So, if we can see the radiological picture, so this is nothing but a lateral type of dentigerous cyst which is showing a proliferation on one side, lateral side, it is a right side, lower mandibular third molar. So, based on histology, dentigerous cysts have been uh, extensively studied, uh, it is it like it has a epithelial lining, uh, it has a lumen, 
uh, and the connective tissue. So, how is the epithelial lining? The epithelial lining in cases where there is no inflammation, it is just a non keratinized epithelium without presence of any reteritis. And the connective tissue wall is composed of a thin fibrous connective tissue. So, there is no inflammation, uh, there are no inflammatory cells present. So, in presence of inflammation, the epithelial lining which is the non keratinized shows hyperplasia with presence of rate apex, rate apex formation is seen. The connective tissue wall it is composed of uh, fibrous connective tissue with presence of few of the inflammatory cells and uh, the characteristic uh, uh, features of the inflamed the dentigerous cyst is nothing but the presence of rustan bodies, rustan bodies are linear curved highline bodies uh, with varying stainability uh, when observed. And uh, the, the, wall, uh, the epithelium of dentigerous cyst shows the islands of odontogenic epithelium. Uh, these are nothing but uh, like we can say daughter cells like that, they give rise to more of epithelial proliferation. Yeah, the content of cyst lumen is nothing but thin straw colored fluid when you, so when you extract the contents of the cyst and observe it, uh, macroscopically uh, they are show thin watery yellow fluid with Sometimes uh, in presence of inflammation, it may be blood tinged. You have since it's a unilocular radiolucency, you have to uh, differentiate it from other unilocular le uh, lesions like the unicystic amyloblastoma and adenomatoid rotogenic tumor. Just when you observe the radiograph, just when you observe the radiograph, you see a unilocular lesion surrounding a unerupted tooth. So at that time, your differential diagnosis should be unicystic amyloblastoma and adenomatoid rotogenic tumor. Then you have to correlate it with other features like the clinical features and histologic features to give a correct diagnosis. Uh, the dentigerous cyst uh, is like commonest of all the jaw cysts about 20 percent of uh, cases uh, show presence of this jaw cyst and the recurrence is like li little bit uh, rarity, it is not so common um, and uh, sometimes in few cases if there is a excessive proliferation of the epithelium, it may progress to formation of uh, amyloblastoma and the source of this uh, epithelial proliferation is nothing but the lining epithelium only. Squamous cell carcinoma and mucoepidermoid carcinoma are also seen if the epithelial proliferation continues and the islands of odontogenic epithelium also continue proliferation and the mucus secreting cells are included in that. So, then that cases we can see mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Treatment of this is nothing but surgical enucleation or excision, recurrence is rare phenomena. So, this is nothing but the dentigerous cyst. Eruption cyst, uh, it is also uh, odontogenic cyst that surrounds the crown of an unerupted tooth, but it is differentiated from dentigerous cyst like that the tooth has uh, not erupted into oral cavity because it is prevented from eruption by some impending barrier like the soft tissues of the oral cavity. The gingiva prevents the eruption of crown that leads to cyst formation here. So, the teeth has erupted through bone, but it has not erupted through soft tissue. Whereas, in dentigerous cyst, the tooth is completely into the bone, it is not, uh, the unerupted tooth is completely in bone there. So, eruption cyst, it is also known as eruption hematoma because when you explore the contents of the cyst, you can see blood filled. Uh, 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 fluid will be there and um, it appears bluish or purple on exploration. So, that is why it is called as eruption hematoma. Etiology is nothing but the tooth, unerupted tooth, it is uh, it's, the tooth is trying to erupt in oral cavity, but it is prevented from eruption by some soft tissue. Like the, the, the soft tissue, the gingiva is uh, fibrous in nature, it is like dense fibrous uh, tissue. So, that uh, leads to uh, eruption cyst. Since the tooth are erupting in oral cavity, so both the deciduous teeth and the permanent dentition, both of them may be affected. It is frequently encountered in children, uh, age of the children can be anywhere between 6 to 10 at whatever age uh, the tooth are erupting, the particular tooth are erupting. There is no predilection like only this tooth are affected, that tooth are affected, nothing like that, it can affect any tooth. So, clinically you can observe it as a swelling of the alveolar ridges, swelling on the alveolar ridges which is uh, fluctuant swelling. It is usually a painless swelling and the swelling will be about 1 to 1.5 centimeters uh, in the site where tooth is beginning to erupt. It is usually a painless condition 
uh, you can notice it as a bulge uh, in the oral cavity on the alveolar ridges. Radiologically, uh, since it is a soft tissue cyst, uh, the tooth is covered by the overlying gingiva, right? So, it appears as a soft tissue shadow in the radiologic, uh, uh, radiographically. So, radiologic picture is not uh, that diagnostic. Clinical picture is the only thing which gives you an idea that, yeah, th this is an eruption cyst. So, hist uh, when you uh, see the specimen microscopically, it is lined by a stratified squamous epithelium. Presence of inflammation uh, is in, in inevitable. So, the chronic inflammatory cells are seen uh, and the wall is made up of dense fibrous connective tissue. No specific treatment is required as the eruption cyst as the tooth progresses and due to mastication taking place in oral cavity, the cyst ruptures, the contents are released and the tooth erupts into oral cavity. So, this is like discovered incidentally, uh, it happens in every normal case, but it is not noticed. Before even you notice the cyst regresses, the contents are liberated and the tooth erupts. So, another uh, important aggressive lesion of oral cavity is nothing but the odontogenic keratocyst. Odontogenic keratocyst, the term odontogenic keratocyst was given by Philipson. Then uh, there was another author named Toller who suggested that odontogenic keratocyst is actually it is a benign neoplasm, it is a tumor, it is a benign uh, neoplasm and not a cystic lesion. So then its name has been changed to kerato keratocystic odontogenic tumor. So now odontogenic keratocyst is reclassified as uh, the newer name is keratocystic odontogenic tumor. Actually uh, odontogenic keratocyst uh, it is a potentially aggressive lesion uh, because of its characteristics like uh, its behavior. It is locally aggressive, destructive. Before even you uh, take a radiograph and you come to know of your condition, the cyst would have expanded to such an extent that whole of the bone uh, is involved up to the ramus, mandibular area, inferior border of mandible and pathologic fractures are also See, so because of its aggressive nature, it has been called uh, keratocystic odontogenic tumor. And histopathologically also, it is uh, it has it shows very distinctive features. So odontogenic keratocyst, uh, it's of two types. So based on the uh, contents of the lumen, or the uh, based on the deposition of keratin, or based on the surface, it's called parakeratinized odontogenic keratocyst and orthokeratinized odontogenic keratocyst. We'll study the histology. So, orientogenic keratocyst can occur over a wide age, wide age range, right from children to elderly and so frequently more commonly encountered in males than females. Uh, it is it's also uh, uh, the commonest site for OKC is the mandibular molar area, mandibular third molar area followed by maxillary molars and maxillary cuspids, then the mandibular premolars and molars. So, Clinical symptoms are most of the time it is an asymptomatic lesion or sometimes it is associated with when it has expanded to such an extent that a whole of the bone is involved. You can see a swelling uh, and pain and neurologic manifestations because whole uh, if suppose that it, uh, the lesion is occurring in the mandibular molar area, uh, the whole of uh, bone is restricted, the inferior border of mandible is involved, it has involved the ascending ramus up to the condyle. In such cases you can see a uh, very aggressive swelling in presence of discharge and uh, neurologic abnormalities like paresthesia of lip or teeth are seen because it is involving the nerve there. So, because of its aggressive nature, uh, it is called as a keratocystic odontogenic tumor. And uh, clinical, clinical picture is not diagnostic. You discover this on uh, radiographically only. Radiographically, you can see a multilocular lesion if uh, it has involved or extended much. It is actually a radiolucent area with smooth and corticated margin. So, the lesion are when you see a radiographic picture, the lesion must have expanded to the point that uh, it is giving you symptoms. Uh, you cannot see the beginning of the lesion, like you cannot see it as a small cyst then enlarging, no, not, not like a uh, dentigerous cyst. 
before you even notice the cyst must have uh, involved considerable amount of bone uh, bone destruction, bone expansion, all the displacement of teeth, extreme displacement of teeth, severe root resorption of all teeth, clinical mobility of teeth must have occurred. Yeah, sometimes uh, unerupted tooth is involved in cases of 25 to 40 percent. So now you, when you see, when you uh, excise the lesion and you, when you go for a microscopic study, you see that the lining epithelium is characteristic. It is like uh, it shows 6 to 8 layers of thickness. In case of parakeratinized odontogenic keratosis, the surface appears corrugated. The parakeratinized surface is corrugated. Then uh, the basal layer of cells, uh, they show the characteristic picket, picket fence or tombstone appearance. It is nothing but all the basal layer of cells are like elongated and the nuclei are, uh, nuclei are um, focused towards one side giving the appearance of a tombstone. The connective tissue shows islands of uh, epithelium that is nothing but the daughter cells which are the potential sites for recurrence of lesion because uh, these satellite cells uh, act as uh, sites for epithelial proliferation uh, contributing to aggressiveness of the lesion. And the lumen of the keratocyst it is filled with a straw colored fluid or more commonly in cases of orthokeratinized odontogenic cyst, it is filled with thick creamy material. So in uh, the orthokeratinized odontogenic keratosis, it differs from parakeratinized surface by deposition of keratin on the epithelial surface. So this keratin, uh, it just uh, deposits in the lumen of the cyst contributing to the creamy material. So treatment for the odontogenic keratosis is uh, it is a potentially aggressive lesion. So, enucleation, surgical excision along with the replacement of the destructive structures like if the inferior border of mandible has been involved then replacement with reconstruction plates has to be carried out. So, the severely resorbed teeth are extremely mobile like they, 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 they do not stay in oral cavity, they have to be like extracted. So, Recurrence is also common in odontogenic keratosis and malignant transformation has been reported in many cases. Few believe that dentigerous cyst uh, has been progressed to forming this uh, odontogenic keratosis also uh, because of the cystic proliferation of the lining epithelium that is also one reason. So, when the lesion has been reported as multilocular lesion radiographically, you have to again differentiate this lesion from amyloblastoma radiographically. And histopathologic uh, features actually give you a correct diagnosis uh, coming to odontogenic keratosis. So, uh, multiple odontogenic keratosis, it is a feature of gorlin golds syndrome. So, what is gorlin golds syndrome? gorlin golds syndrome, it is actually uh, syndrome which is affecting uh, many of the systems. Uh, actually, whenever you uh, see multiple odontogenic keratosis, you have to rule out the syndrome. Uh, you have to rule out the other, uh, look out for the other features of the syndrome, like the um, gorlin gold syndrome. gorlin gold syndrome is also known as the basal cell nevus syndrome or the bifidrid syndrome. It affects many systems like the cutaneous anomalies are nothing but the occurrence of basal cell carcinoma dermal tumors or cysts, palmar and plantar keratosis. Then uh, oral manifestations are presence of multiple odontogenic keratosis and presence of bifid drip. Uh, ophthalmic uh, manifestations are hypertelorism and blindness. Neurologic manifestations include mental retardation, uh, dural calcification and uh, it is associated with hypogonadism in males and ovarian tumors in females. So uh, that is nothing but the gorlin gold syndrome or basal cell nevus syndrome. So another common developmental odontogenic cyst is the gingival cysts of adults. Gingival cysts of adults are nothing but painless uh, soft tissue masses seen in gingiva of adults. These, uh, play, uh, this proliferation is because of cell rests of dental lamina. Uh, the etiology is nothing but the cystic transformation of dental lamina that is the epithelial uh, rest of dental lamina shows 
proliferation which gives rise to formation of cavity. Another thing is implantation of surface epithelium into the deeper tissues. It uh, has also been reported as a cause for gingival cysts. Gingival cysts are uh, like more common lesions. They are like seen on the fifth and sixth decade of life that is in elderly individuals uh, with uh, no periapical infection or no carious teeth like that. It's just a soft so, swelling seen in the gingiva. Gingival cyst is nothing but a soft swelling seen in the gingiva which is fluctuant and which is painless. There is no history of pain. Occasionally when you uh, just do a clinical examination, you observe a nodule like a thing, mass, soft tissue mass in the oral cavity. It occurs either on the free gingiva or on the attached gingiva. Yeah, the characteristic feature is that the associated teeth are vital. So, there is no uh, question of uh, abscess or um, periapical cyst like that because the teeth are vital, the teeth are healthy. Uh, the surface of lesion is also of normal color, it is not showing any signs of inflammation or erythema. So, you can see the clinical picture. So, the arrow points to the soft tissue mass on the free gingiva. So, Clinical diagnosis is the best thing when you go for uh, gingival cysts because the associated teeth are vital. If suppose the, there were carious teeth, you would have suspected, you would have differentiated it from uh, gingival cyst from periapical cyst. So, the teeth are vital, there is no carious infection, it is gingival cyst. So, when you study this soft tissue mass histologically or microscopically, you see that it is lying by a flattened stratified squamous epithelium and there are presence of thickenings of epithelium here and there. These are nothing but the plaques, the focal thickenings of epithelium and the epithelial cells uh, show deposition of glycogen rich cells. These are nothing but the vacuolar cells present in the epithelial lining presence of inflammation is rare, there are no inflammatory cells present. The treatment of this is nothing but excision for cosmetic reasons because there are, it is not associated with pain anywhere. Similarly, uh, developmental non-odontogenic cysts are nothing but the gingival cysts which are seen in the newborn uh, Epstein pearls and Bonds nodules. These are non-odontogenic in origin uh, that we will study later on. Then the, we have uh, one more common, uncommon lesion that is the lateral periodontal cyst. Lateral periodontal cyst, it is a developmental odontogenic cyst which occurs on the lateral root surface area. Lateral periodontal position, like if you can see the radiological picture there, the tooth has been restored and the adjacent, uh, you can see there is loss of periodontal ligament, uh, there is no presence of lamina dura and you can see a uh, radiolucent area in the uh, lateral surface area of root. So, you have to differentiate lateral periodontal cyst from lateral periapical cyst. Yeah, periapical cyst can also occur in the lateral surface area position only. But for the periapical cyst, that particular tooth will have a periapical infection or a source of irritation like that. Well, for, for periodontal uh, surface, uh, for, for the periodontal cyst, uh, it is not the case. And it is more common in uh, uh, periodontal cysts are seen over a wide age range from uh, and more commonly in the elderly individuals. Slight male predilection is seen. Most commonly, the sites where they are encountered is no, nothing but the mandibular premolars followed by the anterior maxillary regions. Usually, they are asymptomatic and discovered uh, radiographically. Sometimes, uh, so swelling, intraoral swelling may be seen in the gingiva, which is associated with pain. The differentiating factor between the lateral periodontal cyst and lateral periapical cyst are the vital uh, vitality of teeth. For lateral periodontal cyst, the teeth will be vital. And uh, cysts are about uh, less than 1 centimeter in size. So, clinically it is not diagnostic, uh, it is diagnostic radiographically only. 
So, radiographically you notice a round to avoid radiolucency. That sclerotic margin that is the peripheral bony reaction is present. So, the cyst is just about 1 centimeter in size. The cyst can be present anywhere between the cervical margin to the root apex, but between the two roots, uh, mean to say lateral surface of the roots. And uh, when you study the lesion, uh, when you excise the lesion and study it microscopically, it shows presence of a lining epithelium which is non-keratinized. So, the lining epithelium may be just about 1 to 5 cell layers thick and uh, sometimes the uh, epithelial cells are flattened or cuboidal in uh, shapes. So, flattened to cuboidal epithelial cells may be seen which are composed of glycogen rich clear cells. So, the connective tissue uh, it exhibits uh, zones of hyalinization. The presence of inflammation is rare because uh, it is not related to caries or periapical infection. So, inflammatory cells are not present. Treatment for uh, lateral periodontal cyst is nothing but enucleation follow up. A recurrence of lateral periodontal cyst is very rare. So, once excised uh, the lesion does not recur and um, since they are not painless lesion, so they are uh, discovered accidentally only. So, patient does not give any source of complaint for you. Calcifying odontogenic cyst, uh, calcifying odontogenic cyst is an uncommon lesion of the jaws. Uh, it is also known by other names like Gorlin cyst. Uh, there have been debates by a lot of authors stating that calcifying odontogenic cyst is actually a tumor. So, it is a benign tumor because of excessive proliferation of the epithelial lining. So, many others have suggested that there are two variants for this calcifying ontogenic cyst. One is the cystic variant, another is the uh, solid variant that is the tumor. So, the solid variant is nothing but the dentino dentinogenic ghost cell tumor. The cystic variant is the calcifying odontogenic cyst. So, we, we are studying the cystic variant now. So, calcifying odontogenic cyst uh, it is uncommon lesion, it is uh, like accidentally discovered, it is not associated with any pain. Uh, it is the site of location of the calcifying odontogenic cyst is unique, like it is seen in the anterior mandibular region. While till now whatever we have seen like the dentigerous cyst uh, or the odontogenic keratic cyst all have a specific predirection for the posterior region of mandible. So, whereas the calcifying odontogenic cyst it is seen in the anterior region of mandible or maxilla. So, it is seen over a wide age range that is a peak early in the second decade that is the 20 to 30 years like that and there is no sex predilection it is equally distributed in both males and females. So, the most common uh, complaint of the patient is the swelling uh, just uh, expansile swelling seen in the anterior region of mandible without uh, any pain associated uh, teeth may be displaced or uh, there will be root resorption of the teeth. So, little bit mobility of the teeth can be seen. So, this, um, this, uh, this is an intraosseous lesion. So, it causes bone expansion to such an extent that the tooth are displaced and it is giving a facial asymmetry. So, the characteristic uh, feature of the calcifying odontogenic cyst is nothing but its histologic picture. Histologic picture shows proliferation of epithelial cells. Uh, that is the ghost cells, presence of ghost cell keratinization is the characteristic feature. So, we will study uh, what is the radiologic feature. Uh, radiologically, you, this calcifying odontogenic cyst can be a unilocular or uh, I mean radiolucent lesion or a radiolucent with presence of few radiopacities. Radio, radiolucent entirely or radiolucent with presence of few radiopacities. So, these are uh, unilocular radiolucent lesions with presence of calcified masses in them. So, inevitably because of bony expansion uh, it causes the displacement of roots or root resorption of adjacent teeth. So, histologically the lining epithelium is 6 to 8 uh, cells thick stratified squamous epithelium. The lining epithelium shows reversely polarization of basal cell layers. This reverse polarization of basal cell layers uh, is a characteristic feature uh, seen in uh, calcifying odontogenic cyst. When we see odontogenic keratocyst, it just shows uh, pa polarized palisaded basal cell nuclei. Here there is in calcifying odontogenic cyst, there is reverse polarization of nuclei and the presence of ghost cells. 
the ghost cells are uh, nothing but keratinized epithelial cells which show epithelial cells which show excessive keratinization have been called as the ghost cells they differ from normal epithelial squamae in that the there is presence of a vacuole the nuclear membrane has been reduced these ghost cells are derived from the reduced enamel epithelium only ghost cells are enlarged balloon ovoid and they stain eosinophilic so this ghost cell keratinization this is the characteristic feature or the distinctive feature of the calcifying odontogenic cyst so you have to differentiate calcifying odontogenic cyst from other cysts uh, histologically based on the presence of this ghost cells treatment is nothing but uh, treatment for calcifying odontogenic cyst is enucleation with curettage and another um, important histologic feature of this cyst is the presence of uh, dentinoid the dentinoid is nothing but the irregular calcified mass of tissue uh, because of the presence of dentinoid uh, it has been uh, related to its similarity to ameloblastoma so ghost cells and the presence of dentinoid may be present or may not be present so these two are the characteristic features of the calcifying odontogenic cyst whereas the dentinogenic ghost cell tumor it also has similarities to the cyst but it is a solid variant of the uh, gorlin cyst that is the here the cystic variant it's uh, like uh, it has an epithelial lining it has a cavity it shows presence of radiolucency with deposition of dentinoid whereas when you see the cystic variant you will study uh, uh, what are the differences between the odontogenic cyst and the dentinogenic ghost cell tumor later on and another common uncommon lesion is the glandular odontogenic cyst glandular odontogenic cyst it is an uncommon lesion it has also been called as the mucoepidermoid odontogenic cyst because here the epithelial lining of the cyst secretes mucus so that's why it's called as the mucoepidermoid cyst uh it uh, it has to be differentiated from lateral periodontal cyst uh, based on the lining epithelium only because uh, it occurs in the same location as the lateral periodontal cyst so it is seen over a wide age range and slight male predilection uh, and the anterior mandible uh, glandular odontogenic cyst is also seen in the anterior mandibular region so it's differentiated from other cyst and how are the lesions the lesions uh, develop over a wide age range they develop over a wide uh, period that is they may begin very uh, as a slow progressive lesions which show growth uh, over many years over a period of many years they are painless and yeah they are locally destructive also because of the secretion of mucus by the lining epithelium the mucus gets deposited and there is increase in the size of uh, cavity leading to more and more bone destruction so radiographically it shows a multilocular pattern uh, there has been uh, there have been uh, another cyst called botryoid odontogenic cyst it is nothing but a glandular odontogenic cyst but with specifically only with multilocular pattern histologically also it shows difference between uh, glandular odontogenic cyst and uh, botryoid odontogenic cyst so glandular odontogenic cyst has a non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and the epithelium shows characteristic pseudo glandular structure because the epithelium is uh, mucus secreting cells so the it shows the pseudo glandular structure and mucus producing cells so there are at few points there are like epithelial thickenings also known as plaques so glandular odontogenic cyst is an uncommon lesion treatment is nothing but excision diagnosis uh, you have to correlate the radiographic picture Uh, and the clinical symptoms and uh, best diagnosis is done only after histologically you see the mucus producing cells so botryoid odontogenic cyst is nothing but a variant of glandular odontogenic cyst with a multilocular pattern now we'll see the developmental uh, cysts which are non odontogenic in nature mostly they arise along the lines of embryonic fusions uh they are seen because of the entrapment of epithelial cells along the lines of fusions like the lot of uh, fusions happen like the fusion of palatine bones fusion of palatine bones with the maxillary nasal process medial nasal process lateral nasal process so along these processes if epithelial cells are entrapped and they undergo proliferation there is cystic transformation of the epithelium and it leads to cyst formation so we'll see the nasopalatine duct cyst 
and the nasolabial cyst, median alveolar cyst or the globulomaxillary cyst. So first one, nasopalatine duct cyst. Nasopalatine duct cyst, uh, it is also known as nasolab incisive canal cyst or nasopalatine canal cyst. It is mostly seen in the region of incisive canal. As we all know that incisive canal, it is situated behind the uh, maxillary central incisors. So in between that, we have incisive canal. So cyst occurs in that region. So nasopalatine duct cyst, it is a common developmental non-odontogenic cyst. It is arising because uh, epithelial rem, uh, cells are entrapped along the lines of fusions of this uh, embryonic process, fusion, embryonic fusion during closure of the embryonic fusion uh, in the region of incisive canal, the cyst arises. No, normally what happens is the nasopalatine duct, it undergoes degeneration. It should undergo progressive degeneration. But if few of the epithelial cells proliferate in the nasopalatine duct region, you, you, there is formation of the cyst. So uh, one is associated uh, with the nasopalatine canal, other is you see just a swelling in the region of incisive canal. So this is nothing incisive papilla. So this is nothing but a soft tissue cyst of the incisive canal or incisive papilla. Next, uh, uh, you see the clinical appearance of the nasopalatine duct. It is seen over a wide age range, mostly in the middle age groups. And it is about 18 to 20 times more common in males when compared to females. So the commonest symptom uh, for uh, nasopalatine duct cyst is like swelling in that area. Uh, the cyst may be small or may be large. Sometimes the smaller cysts, they rarely present any clinical symptoms. And the larger cysts, they may be associated with swelling or pain in that region. Mostly this nasopalatine duct cyst is seen in the anterior maxillary region, in the region of incisive canal behind the central incisors. And sometimes it happens that the cyst may be very, very small, but it presents with uh, I mean, uh, such a uh, huge clinical symptoms and uh, discomfort to the patient, pain in the anterior maxillary region, associated swelling will be there. So, and sometimes it happens that very large cysts are there and uh, there are no clinical symptoms and it is discovered accidentally. So, these are the clinical features. If we see radiologically, it appears as a heart shaped radiolucency between the roots of two central incisors, two maxillary central incisors. And uh, it is seen in the anterior region of palate, in the midline of palate. And uh, the radiolucency, it's, uh, it shows a peripheral sclerosis of bone. Uh, if we see, if we study the cyst microscopically, we see that the lining may be of the native origin, that is the columnar, uh, columnar or stratified squamous epithelium, pseudostratified squamous or the columnar, which is native for that region. Then uh, if you see uh, the, there will be presence of nervous tissue, fibroblasts, vascular bundles, everything which is present in the, in the anterior maxillary region normally are included within the cyst. And the connective tissue shows presence of inflammation if the cyst is infected and if you have pain if associated periapical infection is there then you can see inflammation of the of the cyst uh, treatment is nothing but surgical excision of the cyst then uh, nasolabial cyst nasolabial cyst it is also known as nasoalveolar cyst or cystosis basically this nasolabial cyst is a soft tissue cyst uh, it does not arise within the bone, it is seen at the junction of the globular process of the medial nasal process and maxillary process. When there is a fusion of medial nasal process with the maxillary process, epithelial cells are entrapped along this fusion and you get to see the nasolabial cyst. Uh, it is basically seen in the mucolabial fold, uh, that is the labial vestibule uh, in front of the maxillary central incisors and just situated just below the uh, ala of maxillary. Uh, ala of nose. So the point of fusion where the ala of nose uh, fuses with the maxilla, that is the region where this nasolabial cyst is encountered. 
So, few, on, few of the authors believe that nasolabial cyst actually arises from the lower portion of the nasolacrimal duct, but more commonly it is due to entrapment of uh, epithelial remnants only. It is a soft tissue cyst, nasolabial cyst. It is seen over a wide age range more commonly in the middle aged individuals and males are affected more commonly than females. Uh, it presents as a slow growing swelling. So, it takes it may take around a period of years or a decade for the symptoms to develop. Most commonly patient uh, will have a uh, you will see obliteration of the vestibule. There is a swelling in the labial vestibule and uh, the patient complaining of pain and difficulty in nasal breathing because uh, what happens is whenever there is a swelling in labial vestibule particularly related to nasolabial cyst the ala of uh, nose they just lift up they extend up so uh, extra orally you can see that the ala of nose are lifted up so intra orally there is just a uh, swelling or bulge in the labial sulcus so if you see a radiographic picture because it is essentially a soft tissue cyst uh, it does not present much of a radiological picture, but whenever the nasolabial cyst is of sufficient size, it, it may cause the erosion of the underlying maxilla. So, at that time you can see sclerosis or resorption of the uh, surface of maxilla may be seen. Uh, histologically, if you see microscopically, uh, it presents a picture of the native uh, epithelial lining whichever is present. Uh, in that region. Specifically, it is the non-ciliated pseudo-stratified uh, columnar epithelium and because uh, as we all know that this region has more of a mucus secreting lining and also goblet cells may be seen and the connective tissue wall it is essentially fibrous in nature. Treatment for nasolabial cyst is nothing but excision, surgical excision of the lesion. It rarely tends to recur and malignant transformation is also very very rare. Naso alveolar uh, cyst is uh, relatively uncommon when compared to the naso palatine duct cyst. Other cysts are the, there is one more cyst called the median alveolar cyst. Median alveolar cyst or the median palatal cyst. Median palatal cyst, they are more common along the lines of fusion of the two palatine process or the two palatine bones. Whenever they are trying to fuse, uh, the epithelial cells of uh, 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 they get uh, entrapped between them and they uh, may lead to cyst formation. Clinically, it is a relatively uncommon lesion and uh, clinically it presents as just as a swelling in the anterior region of palate. Uh, yeah, uh, radiologically, it presents as a radiolucency, oval shaped radiolucency in the anterior region of palate. Uh, you have to just, uh, because it is presenting uh, difficulty in uh, swallowing and all, you just have to excise the lesion. The, there are some palatal cysts which are uh, specifically seen in the newborn individuals. These are mostly seen on the alveolar ridges of the infants. They present as uh, submucosal or sessile nodules on the alveolar ridges. Epstein pearls and Bonds nodules are like two different entities, but uh, th there are a lot of similarities, so they are confused uh, as to be of same. But uh, origin is same, both are arise because of the entrapment of epithelial uh, cells that is the epithelial uh, remnants of the dental lamina give origin to this palatal cyst. So, both Epstein pearls and Bonds nodules are the palatal cyst, but they are like different in their clinical appearance. If we see the Epstein pearls, they are actually keratin felt they are actually Epstein pearls are filled with keratin, but they are actually nodules seen on the alveolar ridges of the gingiva, mostly in newborn, newborns or infants. There are bonds nodules, bonds nodules are nothing but keratin filled cysts. So, bonds nodules are cysts, whereas Epstein pearls are cystic nodules seen on the gingiva. Uh, bonds nodules, they are seen on the junction of uh, hard palate and the soft palate, whereas Epstein pearls, they are seen on the mid midline of the palate. So, here we can see the clinical picture of a bonds nodule. Uh, it is appearing as a just a mucosal nodule which is a little bit yellowish in color or uh, sometimes it will be transparent or bluish also. It is seen at the junction of hard and soft palate. 
सो क्लिनिकल प्रेजेंटेशन इज नथिंग बट ससाइल म्यूकोजल पैप्यूल्स और नॉड्यूल्स ऑन द एलवेलर रिजेस दिस इज दिस सिस द टेंड टू बी सो सुपरफिशियल दैट ड्यूरिंग द क्लिनिकल एग्जामिनेशन ओनली दिस सिस आर लोकेटेड जस्ट इन द सुपरफिशियल स्किन एंड कनेक्टिव टिश्यू सो ड्यूरिंग द क्लिनिकल एग्जामिनेशन ओनली दे जस्ट रपच्चर ऑफ एंड लीड टू एक्सपल्शन ऑफ द कैराटिन कंटेंट इन दैम so they are called the superficial cyst so mostly they are discovered accidentally on routine examination only uh, there is no discomfort or pain to the patient uh, or uh, any form of uh, discomfort and even while during examination only they tend to rupture so there are less chances of reported 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 cases by the patient so clinically uh, we have seen that uh, appearances microscopically uh, the palatal cyst present as a epithelial lining the epithelial lining lacks any redergers and the lumen whatever keratin is felt the keratin it appears to arrange in the layer of concentric layer so the term onion ring is given to it the fib the connective tissue is fibrous in nature uh, treatment is nothing but Uh, you you need not give any treatment the cysts are such superficial that they just rupture by themselves and there is another uh, relatively uncommon uh, cyst called the globulo maxillary cyst according to the who classification whatever we are studying odontogenic non odontogenic uh, cyst is the classification given but the globulo maxillary cyst it is a developmental cyst only but Uh, it has been supposed to be uh, read as a odontogenic cyst by few authors few of the authors have uh, given the term that the, no it is not odontogenic it may be because of uh, soft tissue soft tissue cyst or non odontogenic in nature so according to who classification globulo maxillary cyst has been put under a classification called a cyst of debatable origin so it is nothing but a fissural cyst it is arising along the lines of fissures of uh, because of the uh, epithelial entrapment it is a cyst which is found in the bone so between the maxillary lateral incisor and canine teeth if we uh, see the naso palatine duct cyst it is seen between the two central incisors right this globulo maxillary cyst it is seen between the lateral incisor and the canine tooth so even before you notice the lesion clinically the cyst uh, must have enlarged to such an extent that it causes the roots of lateral incisor and canine teeth to diverge in two different ways so etiology is nothing but the epithelial entrapment along the junction of globular portion of medial nasal process and maxillary process along this lines if uh, the cell rests of dental lamina are uh, entrapped they give rise to this cyst globulo maxillary cyst so rarely patient uh, presents any clinical symptoms these cysts are discovered accidentally they are not associated with any form of pain or swelling they are just discovered during routine radiographic examination radiographically it presents as a heart shaped inverted pear shaped radiolucency the heart shaped radiolucency is for naso palatine duct cyst globulo maxillary cyst present as a inverted pear shaped radiolucency causing the uh, roots of lateral incisor and canine teeth to diverge in two different ways so uh, microscopically the cyst presents a lining epithelium and a connective tissue wall the lining epithelium is of the native origin that is the stratified squamous epithelium the wall is made up of fibrous connective tissue and because uh, of presence of inflammation Uh, actually it is uh, like a chronic process right L it takes a lot of years to develop this globulo maxillary cyst so inflammatory cell infiltration is common few of the like leukocytes or plasma cells may be seen treatment for globulo maxillary cyst is surgical excision to prevent further expansion of the cyst and to prevent uh, the bony uh, the bony expansion and loss of bone you have to surgically excise this lesion recurrence is very rare unless the cyst lining has ruptured uh, the recurrence is like very rare so 
now we are going to study the cysts of inflammatory origin we have seen all the developmental cysts both the odontogenic and the non odontogenic ones inflammatory cysts are uh, the cysts which are arising because of inflammation the etiology is inflammation etiology for cyst formation is inflammation so we are going to study the radicular cyst that is the most commonest one periapical cyst and the paradental cyst radicular cyst also known as apical periodontal cyst or periapical cyst the periapical cyst is the commonest of all the cysts encountered it's uh, uh, the frequency is about 60% dentigerous cyst uh, the frequency is only about 20% uh, because it is associated with unerupted tooth right here the periapical cyst is associated with inflammation and at one point of time uh, all the teeth uh during uh, any lifetime may show some sort of inflammation because of either of caries or pulpal necrosis so this cyst is more common 60% cases are periapical cyst most early the etiology for uh, periapical cyst is the uh, proliferation of epithelial cell rests of melasses the epithelial cell rests of melasses arise uh, because of uh, stimulation of the periodontal ligament after the hertwig epithelial root sheath is degenerated few of the cells remain they are the epithelial rests of melasses proliferation of these cells uh, leads to cyst formation so it pulpal inflammation is invari invariably present so the process of inflammation starts with the dentinal caries so once the dental caries or the dentinal caries begins the caries process or the microorganism reaches the pulp they the inflammation starts then it progresses to the periodontal ligament and in the periapical area so whatever happens in the periapical area or the region gives rise to proliferation of epithelial cells and in turn cyst formation so initially what happens whenever there is a trauma or caries process to the tooth so pulp shows signs of inflammation these signs of inflammation leads to formation of a radiolucency in the periapical region initially it begins as a granuloma granuloma is nothing but a, a protective mechanism for the pulp okay uh, it's actually a protection for the pulp it shows presence of a mixed inflammatory infiltrate presence of lymphocytes immune competent cells so that they are beginning to react to the inflammation so once the periapical granuloma forms then the cells the innermost cells of the periapical granuloma they begin to just divide and proliferate as and as they divide they are being separated from their source of uh, so from their source of nutrition whatever microorganisms are there they are like separated the innermost uh, cell mass is deprived of nourishment so this then it uh, then the granuloma it forms into a cyst because of the liquefaction necrosis in the innermost mass of cells then it le leads to formation of cavity and leads to formation of a radicular cyst so granuloma forms initially then the epithelial rests of melasses are proliferating then the 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 mass of cells that begins to increase in size it it becomes about 1 cm in diameter that that point of time uh, a cavity is formed and radicular cyst is formed in this way so here we can see in the picture that hertwig epithelial root sheath it is seen along the periodontal ligament surface and that is the source for the epithelial rests of melasses Periapical cysts are the most commonest of all the cysts. They are seen at any age group. They may affect any teeth. Clinically, a patient may not give you a uh, presence of any symptoms because the cyst is a chronic process. Yeah, granuloma formation it's a acute process, uh, but uh, cyst formation it's a chronic process. Uh, initially, the patient may had pain before few months, but now when the cyst is formed. the patient is relatively asymptomatic even on percussion you may feel a very dull pain no history of uh, i mean when you percuss the teeth you cannot 
uh, make out the sharp nature of pain. And if we leave the cyst like that, the cyst has been persisting for decades, then uh, sometimes a chronic uh, infection or inflammatory process occurs and then it leads to activation of the cyst and we can see a suppuration happens in the cyst. Uh, it transforms into a abscess with drainage. This cyst uh, is maybe of just uh, about 1 centimeter in size. It does not affect the surrounding bone. Uh, it may be less than 1 centimeter in size. So, uh, it is not affecting the bone that much as the uh, other cysts like the odontogenic cysts, they begin to expand and cause expansion of surrounding bone, right? So, that is not seen in uh, case of periapical cyst. And the important point to note is the associated tooth almost in all the cases it is non-vital only because the etiology itself is the pulpal necrosis. So, in periapical cysts, all cysts are associated with non-vital teeth. Based on their presence, the periapical cyst may be apical in nature or if they are situated along the lateral surface, then they may be the uh, lateral periapical cysts also. So, uh, radiographically they present as a oval radiolucency or a periapical radiolucency with marked radio-opaque rim. So, few, because of the inflammatory process like uh, the cyst is lined by an epithelial lining and uh, then few of the osteoblasts may be activated and they show the sclerosis of the uh, surrounding bone. So, one uh, radio-opaque rim uh, is seen. It is uh, present uh, inev invariably present along the root apices of the infected seed. So, when you see a radiograph, clinically dental caries may be present along with a periapical cyst formation. The difference between granuloma and cyst is that for granuloma, you cannot make out a radio opaque rim and it will be of very, very small size like 0.5 centimeter in size only. But the cyst, it shows a definite um, radio opaque rim and uh, periapically and, uh, and the size will be of about 1 centimeter in diameter. It will be more than granuloma. Granuloma is like a diffuse thing. But here, uh, uh, cyst is like a uh, compacted thing. It is lined by radio opaque rim. If you see microscopically, uh, the microscopic picture of the periapical cyst, definitely it has a lining epithelium, which is nothing but the stratified squamous epithelium. And the connective tissue, it is fibrous in nature with presence of abundant fibroblasts, lymphocytes, plasma cells, all these denote that both acute inflammatory process and chronic inflammatory process are occurring in the uh, cyst. And uh, the plasma cells, they are particular because they show presence of a eccentric nucleus which are arranged in the form of a cartwheel. So, that is why the um, name given is the cartwheel nuclei. Then as there is presence of inflammation, rustin bodies are present. Rustin bodies are nothing but linear curved high line bodies which stain isnophilic. They are like amorphous in nature, but they stain isnophilic. Uh, and uh, if we see the histological picture here, so presence of rust and bodies, acute inflammatory cells, chronic inflammatory cells are present and abundant fibroblasts may be present. And the cystic lumen, uh, it shows presence of a fluid which are relatively of low molecular weight proteins and the cystic lumen uh, whatever fluid is filled it stains palely isnophilic in nature because of its uh, acute inflammatory process. Treatment is nothing but extraction of the involved tooth. Once the cyst has, uh, uh, once you notice the cyst you can just extract the involved tooth and curate the socket for complete eradication of the cystic lining. If it is like in the initial stages of uh, like periapical inflammation, then you, you must have thought about endodontic treatment. But since this uh, cyst formation, it is progressing over a decade and it takes longer time for you to notice it. So, better to extract the tooth and just cure at the socket. Recurrence is uh, relatively rare. Yeah, if you leave the cystic lining without excision of cystic lining, if you are just uh, removing the contents of the cyst, the cystic lining will be there intact. So, uh, future cases of residual cysts may be seen. 
So, that is nothing but the residual cysts. The residual cysts are nothing but retained periapical cyst. These are mostly seen in areas where previously there was a tooth and uh, the tooth was extracted and in that area, in the edentulous area, you see a cyst formation. Um, in most instances, it has been related to presence of a pe previous periapical cyst which was unnoticed or which was uh, extract, which was curated but incomplete, incompletely uh, excision was done. Incomplete excision of cyst leads to recurrence of the cyst. So, it is uh, you can, clinically you cannot make out a residual cyst because uh, once the, you have extracted the tooth, the alveolar mucosa heals and there are no chances of any swelling like that. So, it is discovered accidentally on radiographic examinations only. So, radiographically the cyst present as a well defined radiolucency about few millimeters to 1 centimeter in diameter and it is like uh, seen in edentulous areas. Treatment is nothing but surgical curatage of the area to prevent underlying bone damage you just curate the area. There, these are other inflammatory cysts called the paradental cysts. Paradental cysts are nothing but cysts which are occurring on the lateral aspect of fruit. Uh, you must not confuse paradental cysts with the lateral periodontal cyst. Because of the location you see, lateral periodontal cysts also occur on the lateral surface of root. And even this paradental cyst, they are also seen on the lateral surface of root. But paradental cysts, most commonly they are seen in areas of inflammation or trauma. Uh, paradental cysts uh, have also been reported to be associated with partially erupted tooth or erupting tooth. So, they may be seen associated uh, in cases of pericoronitis. They are mostly seen on the lateral or the distal aspect. Most commonly they are associated with uh, unerupted tooth, right? So, ma mandibular molars, mandibular third molars, distally they present the presence of a cyst. Uh, radiographically, if you see paradental cyst, you may confuse it to be with a uh, dentigerous cyst. So, because partially erupted tooth is present and uh, dentigerous cyst, the lateral variety, it shows dilatation only on one side, right? So, few of the features of paradental cyst correlate with the dentigerous cyst lateral variety radiologically. Yeah, uh, if you see the clinical symptoms, the associated tooth is vital in case of paradental cyst and the age, uh, you, uh, age of occurrence is the fourth decade of life, middle aged individuals and it presents with a facial swelling and sometimes pain and uh, discomfort. So, well demarcated radiolucency is seen distal to the partially erupted tooth. But uh, the differentiating point between the lateral periodontal cyst and paradental cyst is whenever the term lateral periodontal cyst is used, it means that uh, there is some damage to the periodontal ligament. So, uh, lamina dura is not intact in cases of lateral periodontal cyst. Here in paradental cyst, it is just seen on the lateral aspect of root there is no damage to periodontal ligament, periodontal ligament is intact, there is non-widening of periodontal ligament space, the lamina dura itself is intact, there is a, we can clearly make out the lamina dura on radiograph and uh, new bone or osteophytic reaction is seen adjacent to the to, uh, cyst. Uh, microscopically, it shows the presence of the lining epithelium that is nothing but the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And uh, as I have said, etiology of paradental cyst is inflammation. So, invariably inflammation or inflammatory cell infiltrate uh, histologically is seen. Treatment is nothing but enucleation of the cyst along with the extraction of molar. Since the molar most commonly it is an unerupted or a partially erupted one, so the source of irritation, right? So, extraction of the unerupted molar is also carried out. So, now we have seen the epithelial cyst, overall we have seen the developmental odontogenic cyst, non-odontogenic cyst, inflammatory cyst. All these are true cysts with epithelial lining and with connective tissue wall with a lumen. Now, we are seeing, going to see the non-epithelial cysts. Non-epithelial cysts are uh, nothing but pseudocysts. They lack an epithelial lining. They do not 
have any epithelial lining. So, two cysts are pseudo cysts, they are like relatively uncommon, solitary bone cyst and aneurysmal bone cyst. Solitary bone cyst, it is also known as a traumatic bone cyst or hemorrhagic bone cyst. Most common etiology for formation of the solitary bone cyst is a trauma. So, we have, we'll study about the solitary bone cyst in detail in physical injuries of bone chapter. Yeah. So, now aneurysmal bone cyst. Aneurysmal bone cyst, it is a pseudo cyst. It is like uh, seen in only 1% of cases. Uh, clinically, the aneurysmal bone cyst, they present uh, features of uh, swelling of the area associated with, suppose it is occurring in the mandibular region, it is associated with limited mobility or difficulty in movement of the jaw and the lesion is painful upon motion and you see limited movement and swelling of the joint. It is uh, aneurysmal bone cyst is frequently encountered in young individuals. History of trauma is present. This trauma leads to irritation of the area and uh, it leads to formation of a swelling. What happens is because of trauma, few of the epithelial cells of dental lamina uh, may, be, may become activated. They undergo cystic transformation and then they leads to formation of this aneurysmal bone cyst. So, just clinical diagnosis may not be sufficient. So, whenever there is surgical exploration of the lesion is carried out, so, you see that uh, there is excessive bleeding from the lesion and the blood, it wells up from the tissue and it appears as a blood soaked sponge. Uh, this uh, characteristic of blood spo soaked sponge is upon surgical exploration. So, clinically you can just see a swelling associated with mobility, difficulty in mobility, difficulty in movement of the joint and if you see the radio radiologic picture. Radiographically, it presents as both unilocular and multilocular lesions. When the multilocular lesions are seen, uh, they appear to be divided in form of different compartments. So, that gives the appearance of a honeycomb or multiple soap bubble appearance. Uh, this uh, soap bubble appearance is seen in case of odontogenic tumors, few of the odontogenic tumors. So, just radiographic diagnosis is also not characteristic. It has to be differentiated from the other odontogenic tumors. But the, uh, when you see histologically, the epithelial lining may be missing. That is the diagnostic feature of this. And it is uh, cyst, right? So, it is like filled with uh, fluid. The mul multilocular uh, lesion is seen in the bone which shows peripheral bone reaction. So, cortical bone may be destroyed as the lesion is expanding. The cortex, uh, it approaches the cortex. The cortex is also destroyed. Uh, extensive bone erosion may be seen and along the borders of the lesion, the peripheral bone reacts, that is osteoblasts are stimulated, they form a uh, sclerosis of the bone. If you see microscopic picture of this aneurysmal bone cyst, it lacks an epithelial lining and the fibrous stroma, whatever the connective tissue stroma is there, it shows presence of sinusoidal or uh, cavernous blood filled spaces. These blood filled spaces are the reason why uh, when we encounter, uh, when we go for surgical exploration of lesion, we see blood welling up from the tissue. The spaces may or may not show clot formation. The, it's like whenever you explore the lesion, uh, you see lot of blood oozing out from the lesion. So, that shows the presence of uh, multiple fibroblasts and multinucleated gain cells. So, this is about the aneurysmal bone cyst. So, there are only two cysts which are pseudo cysts that is the uh, solitary bone cyst and the aneurysmal bone cyst. Aneurysmal bone cyst we have studied here and uh, traumatic or solitary bone cyst we are going to study in the physical injuries of bone chapter because the etiology of formation of uh, solitary bone cyst is basically a trauma or a physical injury to bone.